All right, folks, welcome back. So today I want to cover another paper from the recently concluded Hot OS Symposium. And this is a piece of work by researchers at Boston University and Red Hat. And it talks about unikernels and how to turn Linux into a unikernel. To start with, let's cover what a unikernel is. The idea behind a unikernel is pretty old and it is that you want to link your application along with a library of operating system components to build one single binary that you directly boot into. So instead of booting into a general purpose OS like Linux or Unix, and then that general purpose OS executing your application, you link the application and the operating system functionality that you need into one binary and boot directly into your application. Why would you want to do this? The principal advantage is that you can specialize your operating system functionality to exactly what the application needs. This leads to a smaller, leaner binary and also faster performance. Most of that performance improvement comes from simplifying the I.O. code paths. You can sacrifice a lot of generality if you specialize, for example, the TCP IP stack to exactly the kinds of things that your application needs. Another very big source of the performance improvement is the lack of context switching between user space and kernel space. The authors cite the example of memcached running on a unikernel TCP IP stack running twice as fast as running on a general purpose Linux kernel. Unikernels also tend to have small memory footprints, again, since you're specializing to your specific application, and very fast boot times. Unikernels also have security advantages because not only is the total attack surface much smaller than a general purpose operating system, you can also run them inside things like security enclaves. So looks like unikernels have pretty compelling advantages. They are faster, they are smaller, they boot very quickly, they are more secure, and yet they haven't become very mainstream you tend to build unikernels for only highly specialized or very research kinds of systems. The authors claim that the main reason for that is the way current unikernels have been built and the convenience or lack thereof of building and developing unikernels using the current approaches. One way to build a unikernel is from scratch. This is essentially like building a library of components that one could use to build an operating system. There are many examples such as Mirage OS, which only works with OCaml, and a bunch of others. But the issue is that in order for them to gain any traction, they still need some semblance of a standard C runtime and some support for common POSIX-like interfaces. And if you are to do that with the same level of support that a general purpose kernel has, you've given up the advantages of shedding all the complexity of a general purpose kernel. The opposite approach is the stripped down approach where you start with a general purpose kernel and then try to chisel away the parts of it that you don't need. Very often what this involves is actually just forking the source code for something like the Linux kernel and then specializing it to your particular needs. But once you have forked the kernel, you really give up all the advantages that come with having a huge community of contributors and getting all their fixes and updates it becomes an uphill battle to maintain parity between your fork and the main line. So what does all this have to do with Linux? Linux today is on every computing surface imaginable, from mobile phones to large servers and everything in between. 
it very firmly continues to be a general purpose POSIX-like operating system. And with that vast set of requirements that it satisfies comes a lot of complexity. One sign of the strain that comes from that complexity are development platforms like DPDK and SPDK, which are used by applications that need very fast I.O. And what they're basically doing is bypassing all the kernel abstractions for I.O. and going directly to the raw hardware. And when you look at cloud workloads that run inside virtual machines, very often you'll see that you just run one specialized application inside a virtual machine. So you're wasting all the generality and all the abstractions that the kernel has for handling many users and multiplexing resources across them. So we're seeing these two opposing pressures on the Linux kernel. On the one hand, it's incredibly general purpose, and that has made it succeed in a wide variety of scenarios. On the other hand, high performance applications do not really want to pay the price of all those general purpose abstractions and end up using things like DPDK or SPDK that bypass all those abstractions and just go right to the raw hardware. Given what we've seen about unikernels and the various advantages that they have, the authors here are proposing turning Linux itself into a unikernel. In practice, what this would mean is that there would be some kind of mechanism to specify what parts of Linux you need, what parts you don't need, and then to link it with an application into one static binary that you could directly boot into. Why would we want to do this with Linux? Besides all the general advantages of any unikernel, what specifically would a Linux unikernel bring? Well, you basically get all the advantages of Linux's massive community. You get a code base that has been thoroughly battle tested on a large variety of hardware. You get people making bug fixes, adding features. You get support for many different kinds of hardware and so on. If we want to turn Linux into a unikernel, what should our design goals be? These are the four that the authors have picked. The most important thing is that you should be able to take an application and turn it into a unikernel without changing it. It should just be a different compilation target. The second design goal, and this is the crucial unikernel property, is that you should not have to pay the price of context switches when you're performing kernel functionality. The third design goal is to allow optimization across the application and the kernel. Typically, when you run an application in user space, you cannot perform optimizations that look at the complete kernel plus application picture simply because the kernel has already been compiled and linked and the application is compiled and linked and executed separately. But when you have the code for both the kernel and the application together and you're compiling them at the same time into one static image, you can actually perform global optimizations across both those code bases. And the last design goal is more of a social one rather than a technical one, and it is that in the process of turning Linux into a unikernel, you want to make the changes to the kernel itself as small as possible. You want to make those changes small so that they have a higher chance of getting accepted into the mainline kernel source tree. The authors have built a prototype unikernel on Linux, and here they describe how they did it. Typically, the kernel has code that calls the very first process. It's usually something like init, and then init brings up all the other processes, like your login, your terminal, and so on. You have to change that, so instead of calling the very first process, or instead of calling init, you call 
your application code for the unikernel. You have to change the standard C library so that instead of making system calls and crossing the boundary from user space to kernel space, executing kernel functionality simply becomes a function call. And finally, you have to change the build process so that you can link the kernel and the application into one single binary. The authors claim that they had to change only 11 lines and add 20 new lines to the Linux kernel source tree to turn it into a unikernel. Now that is pretty impressive. That is a very small delta for so much unlocked functionality. They also performed a simple benchmark with a simple echo server. And in user space, the average latency of the echo server was about 0.13 milliseconds with the 99 percentile latency being 0.37 milliseconds. Compare that to the unikernel version of the same echo server and the average latency dropped to 0 0.06 milliseconds with the 99 percentile latency being 0 0.22 milliseconds. So what that boils down to is that the average for the unikernel is twice as fast and the tail latency at the 99 percentile is about 40 percent faster. The authors recognize that at this point, this is just a prototype and that they need to do a lot of work to make this much more usable. So to conclude, by developing a prototype, in this paper, the authors have shown that Linux can indeed be turned into a unikernel, and that isn't obvious. They have also shown that it doesn't require huge changes to the existing Linux tree and that it does have some pretty significant performance advantages. This gives them hope that these deltas can get accepted upstream so that making Linux a unikernel is just a compile time option. So that was a paper that talked about unikernels and their advantages and why we would want to turn Linux into a unikernel along with a demonstration proof, so to speak, that this can indeed be done with Linux. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.